Welcome everyone. My name is Corinne and I will be your moderator this evening. I am excited to welcome Dr. Parashar as your speaker tonight, as he will be sharing his knowledge on traumatic dental injuries and CBCT in action. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the box labeled have a question and we will answer them live at the end. And lastly, we are offering CE credit for attending tonight's webinar. To request CE, please click on the CE available icon on your console and complete the survey. We will also be sending out the survey link in the post-webinar email within the next week. If you have any questions regarding CE credit, please contact webinars at henryshine.com. Doctor, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. I will pass it on over to you. Hello and welcome to webinar titled CBCT in Action traumatic dental injuries. I am Vijay Parashar. I'm a dentist and an oral and maxillofacial radiologist. I'm really excited to share my knowledge, share multiple cone beam CT cases showing various types of dental and maxillofacial trauma. I will also review relevant literature and guidelines established by American College of Radiology on imaging criteria. We will also review guidelines of American Association of Endodontics on treating dental injuries and International Association on Dental Traumatology's guideline for evaluating and managing traumatic dental injuries. I'm thankful to all the attendees of this webinar. You are taking time away from your practice and family to be here, and I am really thankful for the same. I've organized the content of this webinar such that it will be clinically significant and will provide you diagnostic and treatment recommendations that you can implement in your practice. I'm also thankful to Henry Shine for providing me this great platform to reach a very large audience. I've always known that Henry Shine has a wide reach into dental community, but I was surprised when a physician friend uh, contacted me from Seattle and my sister-in-law, who's a small animal veterinary surgeon in California, shared a Facebook post of today's webinar. And I'm really, really thankful to Henry Shine for getting the word out. I'm also thankful to Dr. Gary Severance for his help in coming up with the theme and structure for this webinar. I regularly speak about cone beam CT, implant planning, relevance of CBCT and implant planning, we also talk about uh, CBCT applications in dentistry, CBCT interpretation, identify normal anatomy, how to recognize pathology on CBCT scans. But I am thankful to Gary and Patty for coming up with this topic, discussing CBCT and identification of trauma and its management. I'm also thankful to Mary Beth and her team for allowing me to pre-record this presentation and share it with you all. Uh, Dr. Severance had me sign a disclosure form for CE granting purposes. I would also like to share a similar information with all the attendees here. Presenter is not employed by or hold any stocks, options in any cone beam CT imaging company, dental implant company. Presentation includes images that may be privileged and confidential and cannot be reproduced without written consent of the presenter. This academic activity is intended to be scientific and educational in nature. This presentation is focused on interpretation of CBCT images and not intended to act as or to replace manufacturer training on a specific software or a specific CBCT scanner. The opinions, conclusions, experiences, and views expressed in this presentation are of the presenter. Clinical images have not been manipulated or falsified to mislead treatment outcomes. All content, including text, images, audio, or other formats were created for educational and informational purposes only. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of the physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The existing literature and guidelines referenced in this lecture may get modified at a future date. Please continue following updated guidance from dental and medical authorities. I will briefly share my academic journey. I got my initial dental training, which is Bachelor's of Dental Surgery, 
from India. I came to States and uh, I had to repeat my clinical years, which are the third and fourth year of the program, which I did at University of Detroit Mercy in Detroit, Michigan. My radiology residency training, it was a three-year program. I did a combined master's of dental science with oral maxillofacial radiology residency at University of Connecticut in Farmington, Connecticut. And I'm really fortunate that I have been invited to come speak at various dental association meetings on the topic of CBCT and its use in diagnosis. I was invited to speak at American Academy of Fixed Frost annual meeting in Chicago. This was TDA's annual session in San Antonio, Texas. This was uh, AAFP midwinter meeting. A Michigan AGD, it was a hands-on event. Uh, this was uh, again in Texas, Boston University. I was also invited internationally. This was a really interesting meeting. They had me speak about uh, 3D printing in healthcare. It was a forum discussion. I really enjoyed uh, the interaction for this meeting. Recently, we had National Dental Association's 109th annual session right here in Phoenix, Arizona, which is home for me. And uh, I was invited to speak on CBCT applications in general dentistry. We have two images on our screen. The image to the left is the first ever dental radiograph. This was made by Otto Wolkoff. He was a German dentist. He held a photographic plate in his mouth and he imaged or exposed himself to radiation for a total time of 25 minutes. And this is a note from Otto Wolkoff that said that the necessary exposure time of 25 minutes was an ordeal. And the product was the image on the left of your screen. Over the next course of 100 years, there was improvement in the quality of uh, dental radiographs. And the image on the right, this is what a modern bite wing radiograph looks like. Here we can see the crowns, we can see the PFM crown, we can see the endodontic obturation, we can even see a little bit of an open margin on the distal aspect of this mandibular crown. But still, we were missing the buccolingual information. And that buccolingual information was brought to us by a cone beam CT. There are a lot of CBCT machines available in the market. And uh, I went to Henry Schein's uh, website, and they have a large number of products, a large number of CBCT machines that they have listed on their website. Irrespective of the machine that you have, irrespective of the CBCT machine that you have, the information that we will discuss today will not be specific to any cone beam CT machine. It will be generic information, irrespective of the cone beam CT machine that you have, you will be able to use this information. We will not talk about any CBCT machine, but we will just be talking about modality, which is CBCT imaging without any specific uh, machine. Let's quickly review the difference between fan beam CT, which is the type of beam that is used in hospital CT, medical CT, or multi-detector CT, where the shape of the beam is like a fan beam, thin, flat beam, which has to spiral around the patient's head multiple times to image maxillofacial area. When we compare that with cone beam CT, just like the name says, the shape of the X-ray beam is shaped like a cone. It can cover a much larger surface area, and one quick spin around the patient's head will capture the maxillary ma uh, mandibular area. So with one spin, it is able to image the same area that hospital CT will have to spiral around the patient's head multiple times. One of the advantages will be quicker scanning at much lower radiation dose when you compare it with hospital CT scanner. This is what multiplanar reformatted images look. This is called MPR view. And this is available with uh, most CBCT imaging softwares. If you look at the image on the lower right, this is 3D surface rendering or three-dimensional surface rendering. This image gives us a broad overview 
of the anatomy that you're looking at. You can spin this image 360 degrees and take a look at what's going on broadly with the patient. Image on the top right, this is a sagittal view. Image on the top left is an axial view. Image on the left here, this is a coronal view. All of these images talk to each other. We have these crosshairs. Depending on where the crosshair is, these images are created. If you look at this axial view, the green line is going through tooth number eight, which is the tooth represented here on the sagittal view. Sagittal view is really good if you were trying to evaluate teeth and look at the periapical area. If you were looking for periapical pathosis, this is a good view to evaluate it. Axial view is really good when you are trying to see the pulp and the endodontic conditions of the teeth. If there was any missed canal, unfilled canal, non-treated canal, you will be able to identify it relatively quickly on the axial view. Coronal view is this image here on the lower left, which is great to compare right side with the left side if you were trying to look for symmetry here. So if you take a CBCT scan, this is a 3D volume rendering of a cone beam CT. So here on the screen, we have multiple axial views, which are the horizontal views. These are created by taking a magical saw, or if you were to cut this volume horizontally, you will get these axial views. These are good to look for canals, root canals, root canal uh, anatomy, any unfilled canals. Here on the lower right, you're able to see right and left maxillary sinuses. This will be the mandibular ramus on the right side, ramus on the left side. And uh, software tells us that this is the right side of the patient, this is left side of the patient. It's as if we are standing at the patient's feet, looking up, and you are able to create these axial views. Next, for sagittal views, these are vertical cuts, vertical views where you see these red lines. If you were to cut this volume and open at 90 degrees, that will create these sagittal views. These are really good to look for teeth, periapical area, and in this view, you are able to see the patient's airway really well. Other structures that you observe on these cuts will be maxillary sinus, which looks nice and clear. You are able to see part of the cervical spine posteriorly. So these are all sagittal views or the vertical cuts. Coronal views, if you were to cut this 3D volume right here and look at the patient straight on, this will be the right side of the patient. This is the left side of the patient. Posteriorly back here, we are catching a little bit of the ramus, right ramus, left mandibular ramus. We can see maxillary sinuses. You can see nasal cavity structures. You can see the floor of the nasal cavity, inferior nasal turbinate or concha, middle nasal turbinate or concha. There is a little bit or a small sized palatal torus that this patient has. On the right side here, you can see right mandibular condyle, left mandibular condyle. So again, these are all coronal views. Let's take a look at this case. Uh, so here the patient has uh, received trauma to the face and you are able to see changes on these image. This is a 3D surface rendering. And when we look at this image, you are able to see break in the continuity of bone here. You are able to see fracture lines. This will be the orbit, right orbit. So in the infraorbital area, there is a fracture. Right here, we have an alveolar fracture, tooth number eight, tooth number nine. Between nine and 10, you can see there is an alveolar fracture. Let's look at these black and white images. When we look at the coronal section here, let's start with the image on the right side. Left maxillary sinus looks clear. Right maxillary sinus has soft tissue or fluid density, which is completely filling this patient's right maxillary sinus. In addition, when we try to look at the walls of the maxilla, try to compare the left side with the right side. We're able to see break in the continuity of uh, this bone. So when we talk about radiographic features of fracture, or if you are trying to evaluate a scan, and you want to either identify a fracture or rule out a fracture, these are some of the features that you should look for. Try to look for any discontinuity 
in the in the cortical or trabecular bone try to look for a step deformity if we look at something like this even here you can see there is a little bit of a step here floor of nasal cavity there is discontinuity and there is a step between two different fragments of bone and then you should look for any displacement of uh, fragmented uh, bone pieces you should also look for any abnormal soft tissue position if if there is uh, either uh, soft tissue has been displaced going uh, either outwards or inwards from its normal uh, position or even if you see changes like this like on this scan we all observe that the right maxillary sinus there is soft tissue or fluid density again something like this which is similar density to soft tissue and one of the shortcomings of CBCT, which we will uh, review a little bit more in detail, it does not show us or provide us good soft tissue imaging. But here you can see that there is soft tissue fluid density in right maxillary sinus. If it was recent trauma, we should think of a hematoma or bleeding within maxillary sinus. If this is chronic trauma or a little bit later in the healing process, and then you observe that there is new soft tissue or fluid density in the sinus, we should think of sinusitis or sinus infection here. Let's review this information available at American College of Radiology's Appropriateness Criteria Radiation Dose Assessment Introduction. So when we review maxillofacial trauma incidents, so there are about 500,000 ER visits annually and nearly $1 billion is spent in healthcare costs for management of maxillofacial trauma. Majority of facial fractures are results of assault, uh, motor vehicle collision, falls, sporting activity, gunshot wound, and occupational accidents. And facial fractures are observed, again, based on uh, order of frequency. Most frequently, it is seen in the nasal bones, followed by orbital floor fractures. Then we have zygomatic co maxillary complex fracture, maxillary sinus fractures, and then we have mandibular ramus, which is posterior mandible uh, fracture. So these are some information or some numbers from ACR's uh, radi radiation dose assessment introduction. So again, when we talk about uh, imaging, any kind of imaging that is done for uh, facial trauma evaluation, the first thing that the ER physician will establish will be completing an initial patient survey. And in that survey, they make sure that uh, ABC uh, of uh, airway breathing and circulation is first followed before they decide what kind of an imaging would, is, would be helpful for the patient. But uh, airway breathing and circulation is uh, established first, and then the physician will decide on uh, the imaging for trauma. Let's review. Uh, cone beam CT for uh, trauma evaluation. So advantages, one of the things that we should consider is uh, CBCT generally delivers lower radiation dose to the patient, so that is an advantage. But then for evaluation of acute trauma, there are a lot of shortcomings that we observe with CBCT imaging. First is there is limited availability of cone beam CT machines in uh, ER departments. In addition, the, if the patient has additional traumatic injuries, they make it difficult for a patient to be seated or being standing in a CBCT machine, and it is preferred that such a patient is scanned in a supine with a natural head position, which can be established with a hospital medical CT or a helical CT, and it, it is difficult to do that with a cone beam CT. In addition, another uh, huge advantage of hospital CT or multi-detector medical CT is that it allows fine bone detail and soft tissue evaluation. And this is information that is that is not available with cone beam CT. So for our summary, medical CT or hospital CT is superior to cone beam CT for diagnosis of fine bone soft tissue detail required for maxillofacial trauma evaluation. So what is uh, the imaging that is recommended for uh, imaging patients who have received maxillofacial trauma?
So again, this is uh, information from American College of Radiology's uh, uh, radiation dose assessment introduction document. And it mentions that CT maxillofacial, this is a medical CT or helical CT. This is not whole beam CT. So CT maxillofacial without IV contrast and CT head without IV contrast is recommended for imaging of patients that show frontal bone fractures. If, they, if there is anything that is closer to the head, calvarium, then they want to do a CT head along with CT maxillofacial to review the maxillofacial structures. And CT maxillofacial without IV contrast is usually appropriate. And again, it depends on the clinical presentation of the patient where the fine, tune, uh, fine tuning of imaging would be done or further imaging will be ordered depending on what other symptoms uh, and clinical findings the patient is presenting with. But generally speaking, CT maxillofacial without IV contrast is recommended for patients uh, that have pain with upper jaw manipulation. So if you're trying to palpate upper jaw and patient has pain, or if there is pain around zygoma, zygomatic process area, or there is uh, facial elongation. If patient presents with malocclusion, that is there is a step deformity, or uh, the occlusion seems to have changed after uh, patient received trauma, or if there is infraorbital nerve paresthesia, uh, if that is a result of injury, again, for all of these uh, uh, situations, CT maxillofacial, hospital CT, medical helical, uh, CT is recommended. If patient has nasal deformity and there is uh, tenderness around nose or if there is bleeding uh, that is observed from a nasal injury, again, uh, a hospital CT, CT maxillofacial without IV contrast is uh, required. If patient has Christmas, they have difficulty opening their mouth. There is malocclusion. There is uh, bleeding from the gums. There are fractured teeth, displaced teeth. There is mandibular injury. Again, if you are seeing change in the in the occlusion of the mandibular arch, all of these things, uh, the CT maxillofacial without IV contrast will be ordered for the patient in the ER. Let's review this uh, CBCT scan. So we're grabbing the line and moving the coronal sections all the way forward. We're bringing it back. And here, we're going from front to back and you are able to compare the right-sided structures with the left side. And we're going from back to forward. And when we look at the TMJ area, left condyle, there is a difference. Here you can see the right condyle, right mandible, left condyle, there is a discrepancy between right and left. In addition, we can move our sagittal sections, bring it to the area when we, when we do that, we are observing that there is a difference and we can adjust these coordinates and we can create a cut which is parallel to the mandible here on the left side and you are able to observe the fractured fragment. There is a low left condylar neck fracture where there is fracture of the condyle and there is displacement of the fractured condyle. You are able to see these changes here. So let's review this uh, finding. So here you are able to observe a fracture th through the neck of the condyle. In addition, there is displacement of the condyle. When we try to describe the uh, fragment's movement, you are able to see that uh, the muscles of mastication, they have pulled the condyle anteriorly and medially. So here condyle is positioned anterior to the eminence. This is the eminence. In addition, there are some sclerotic changes that are observed on the uh, fracture sites and there is no surgical fixation plate. So there is no surgery that is done to position or reposition this condyle. So impression and recommendation for uh, a scan like this would be left condyle is consistent with a history of trauma. So if, if you wanted to evaluate soft tissue like disc and what is happening to adjacent musculature, if there is more trauma, soft tissue damage, you need to do a hospital CT, which is medical CT or multi-detector CT. And you should also consider doing an MRI if you were trying to evaluate soft tissue. 
again, referral to patient's physician if symptomatic pain and swelling. So before we start working with teeth, you need to get more information or uh, communicate with the physician and make sure that the patient is stable. There is no pain and swelling before we start treating this patient. Let's take a look at this case. It is an interesting case. So here we can see that right posterior teeth are missing. In addition, a large segment of the right mandible is missing. There is metallic bone fixation plate, which is present on the right side. But if we observe right in this area, it appears that this plate has been fractured. So this patient presented with right submandibular and submental swelling and erythema. There was right TMJ area pain and swelling. In addition, teeth number 27, which is this tooth, and 28, they both tested non-vital. So when we try to figure out or make a radiographic impression of what's going on here, we should think of odontogenic abscess because both 27 and 28 are non-vital. In addition, we should also document and talk about this fractured metallic plate and there was associated infection in this area. So this plate is infected, this has to be removed. So the surgeon was able to uh, do a cone beam CT scan for the patient and they were able to print a maxillary and mandibular model and they were able to do a wax up of the prosthesis. So again, these are these are some of the things that are that are now available and they're readily uh, easily available. And this technology is becoming relatively inexpensive when we talk about 3D printing of models. They are able to design the surgery better with uh, these tools that we have available. They were able to see the wax up and they were able to determine the extent coming to the opposing side while they're able to spare the mandibular canal and inferior alveolar nerve on the left side. And uh, this is what the prosthesis look like. And I'm thankful to the surgeon for sharing these uh, really interesting and impressive images. This is uh, a post-op image after this prosthesis was implanted. So again, cone beam CT is helping uh, get better diagnosis and plan the surgical procedures better. And in this case, where there was trauma, there was a fractured plate, the prosthesis could be designed better with the use of three-dimensional technology. Let's take a look at another case. Here, patient was in motor vehicle accident, and they were treated at a local uh, ER. And the, you can see the bone fixation plates in the maxilla, right and left, you can also see plates in the mandible. So let's look at this volume a little bit more. So when we are trying to uh, write our findings or determine our findings, you can see that the left low neck fracture and there is displacement of the condylar head fractured segment anteriorly and inferiorly. In addition, when we look at the mandible, which is in this area, you can see that there is a fracture even in the mandible here. Maxillary anterior area, this is where the patient was missing teeth. These, were, these teeth were lost uh, during the injury or during the accident, but remaining teeth on the left side, when we evaluate the scan, you can see that there are more dentoalveolar fracture lines. So there are some alveolar fractures here. This is what the anterior maxillary bone looked like after the teeth were evulsed or teeth were lost. And the patient wanted uh, uh, fixed prosthesis. They wanted implants. And uh, the implantologist uh, was, was trying to build bone. If you look at the width of bone, it is less than three millimeters. This is what the soft tissue looked like. It looks nice and thick but this is deceptive because cone beam tells us we have very minimal width of uh, bone here in the anterior maxilla. So it was determined uh, that they should do 3D models and be on these 3D models, they planned the surgery and they wanted to bulk up, widen the ridge using bone graft and uh, bone morphogenic protein. And this is a titanium mesh. And this is, this is what the surgery looked like. And they were 
aiming to widen the ridge. So again, another case where uh, cone beam CT did help with uh, more diagnosis of a trauma case. Same patient, when we look at the lower anterior teeth, this is a mandibular uh, tooth number 22. You can observe a horizontal root fracture here. So when we talk about horizontal root fractures, we can localize them based on the location on the root. It could be in the cervical area, it could be mid root, or it could be in the apical area. And management of horizontal root fractures, it depends on location, that is the height, where is it located on the root? And it also depends on the mobility of the fractured segments. And it also depends on the vitality of this tooth. Apical, if there is a horizontal fracture in the apical third, these teeth usually are not mobile and generally they do not require treatment. Horizontal fracture in the middle third of the root generally has favorable prognosis and uh, you need to stabilize the fractured fragment and uh, this, this will help with healing of periodontal structures. In addition, again, this is this is quick overview, but again, a tooth like this with mid-root fracture, you will have to do sequential uh, follow-up. And if this tooth becomes necrotic, you will have to uh, do an endodontic therapy at that time. Cervical third coronal fragment shows usually severe mobility and it has poor prognosis and they generally require extraction. Let's review the scan together. So generally me and my radiologist colleagues, we usually just receive a cone beam CT scan from our general dentist. And uh, sometimes we don't get any clinical information and we try to look at the scan and try to piece together uh, that information. And when we look at the scan on the 3D View, you can see the tooth number seven has a fracture in the in the crown area. So that, that makes us think that there is a history of trauma. So let's look through the scan together. I'm moving these coronal sections going from posterior to anterior. A lot of teeth still are developing or the roots are not completely closed. But when we get to the anterior area, we can see there are a lot of periapical changes. And we can look at the sagittal views now. We'll go completely to one side. Slowly, we are coming towards the midline. Here you can see there are uh, still some open APCs for premolars. And when we get to tooth number eight, there's a periapical lesion. Tooth number nine has a lot of root resorption. Ten also has resorption. So there are quite a lot of changes in maxillary anterior teeth. Here we're going from right to left. Now we will look at the axial view, go all the way up. When I'm reading a scan, this is the view, the MPR view that I spend most of my time on, I'm going from superior inferior. Here we can see the roots, root canals, and if there is any external cervical root resorption, you will be able to identify it. And here, multiple teeth are showing signs for external root resorption. So let's look at uh, these teeth individually. So here we have tooth number seven. We can see the crown fracture here. In addition, this is just a screenshot of the cone beam CT image. Here we can see in the periapical area, there is widening of periodontal ligament space. If we look at the PDL around this root, it appears to be widened. In addition, there is loss of lamina dura. Lamina dura is this thin white line. There is loss of lamina dura, there is widening of periodontal ligament space, and there is well-defined, non-corticated, low density or low attenuation radiolucency in the periapical area of the tooth. So these will be our findings for these two images. In addition, on cone beam, we observed that there were no changes in buccal and palatal cortices around the tooth. So when we are looking at teeth that have received trauma, you should look at the teeth, but you should also look at the adjacent alveolar bone and see if there are any changes in buccal and lingual cortices which are holding the tooth in place, whether there is any thinning, expansion, or if there is any breakdown or break, which will, which will signify uh, an alveolar fracture. But around this tooth, we did not observe any such thing, and there was no tooth displacement. 
there was no external root resorption observed on tooth number seven and bone surrounding it relatively is uh, unremarkable or normal. So our impression for tooth number seven will be apical periodontitis with a fractured crown. So when we talk about uh, crown fractures, they can be classified as uncomplicated crown fracture or a complicated tooth fracture. So if there is only enamel or tendon fracture without involvement of pulp, without any pulp exposure, we will classify it as uncomplicated tooth fracture. But if there is involvement of pulp, there is pulp exposure, this will be classified as complicated tooth fracture. So for uncomplicated tooth fractures, if tooth fragment is available it, it, and it can be bonded, it should be bonded. And uh, if, if you do not have the fractured fragment, then you should try to provide treatment uh, for the exposed dentin with glass ionomer, and then you can provide a permanent restoration. The definitive treatment of fractured crown is restoration uh, with uh, restoration of uh, your liking and uh, your patients. For complicated uh, tooth fracture in younger patients with, where they have uh, open APCs, then you will consider doing pulp capping and you will uh, uh, try to provide partial pulpotomy where you are trying to encourage root development of this tooth. Future treatment uh, for the fractured crown uh, will be restoration. In addition, you have to do sequential follow-up for teeth that have uh, uh, pulp exposure because these teeth have returned necrotic, you will have to provide endodontic therapy. So again, this is just a quick overview and there is more detail and you have to follow up these teeth. Uh, let's look at tooth number eight. When we look at tooth number eight, which is this tooth on the same scan, these are our findings. If we look at the periapical area, we can see periapical radiolucency. This is the buccal cortical plate. This is the palatal cortical plate. And when we talk about buccal uh, cortex or buccal cortical plate, there is thinning of uh, buccal cortical plate, but there is no expansion that the plate has not been pushed out. Similarly, when we look at the palatal uh, plate, it looks unremarkable. There is no breakdown of palatal cortical plate. But on tooth number eight, there were very small areas of external root resorption. So your impression for tooth number eight will be apical periodontitis, which is this, along with external root resorption. Let's look at tooth number nine. So here we have tooth number nine, which is this tooth. Tooth number nine, if you look at the crosshairs, again, it tells us we are looking at tooth number nine. This will be the coronal view, axial view, sagittal view for tooth number nine. And we can see periapical radiolucency around tooth number nine. In addition, we can, we can talk about the buccal and palatal cortical plates, but adjacent to maxillary centrals, we have this anatomical structure, which is nasopalatine canal. And we should try to see whether there is any interruption in the outline of nasopalatine canal. But in this case, there is, there is no interruption or there are no changes in nasopalatine canal. But when we look at tooth number nine, there are quite a lot of changes around this tooth. You can see multiple areas of external root resorption. You can see it on 3D surface rendering and also on this coronal view. In addition, there is alveolar bone loss. If you, if you try to see this bone here, there is a defect here on the mesial and distal aspect of this tooth. So our impression for number nine will be apical periodontitis, which is this, external root resorption, and there is periodontitis, which is this bone loss. Let's look at tooth number 10, which is this tooth here. And cross here, tell us we're looking at tooth number 10. Again, we can see periapical radiolucency around tooth number 10. In addition, we should talk about buccal and palatal cortical plates. There is thinning of this buccal cortical plate, but when we look at the palatal cortical plate, palatal cortical plate looks unchanged. Again, if, if this tooth was getting luxated, if it was getting lateral luxation, that is, that is where 
I will show that uh, very shortly, but that is where you need to see the plates and try to see if there are any changes in these plates or if there is any alveolar fracture. If the plate was fractured, then you will see the tooth displaced and the plate also displaced. But in this case, there's just thinning, but there is no break of this plate. Other changes, there is external root resorption on tooth number nine here. And there are different areas of root resorption on this tooth, on this tooth and uh, bone around it relatively looks normal. And our uh, impression for tooth number 10 will be apical periodontitis with external apical resorption. So let's look at some other uh, uh, injuries uh, with teeth. So this is infraction. An infraction is incomplete fracture or crack of enamel without loss of tooth structure. So something like this, again, this is a diagrammatic representation. I have tried to draw this uh, crack in uh, enamel. And generally, these teeth do not require any treatment. But if this was uh, causing discoloration, you might have to do etching and sealing with resin if there is marked uh, infraction on tooth. Enamel fracture. This will be a complete fracture of enamel, but there will be no sign of exposed dentin clinically. And if this tooth fragment, this tiny little fragment is available, you can, you should try and bond it to the tooth. And again, depending upon the size of this enamel fracture, you might have to do a restoration. Next, let's look at enamel dentin fracture. So these are enamel and dentin fracture without exposing the pulp. Again, on, on your radiographs and even clinically, you should evaluate the tooth, something like this, where there is no involvement of pulp. This will be classified or described as an enamel dentin fracture. In these cases, uh, bond this uh, tooth fragment. If patient is able to bring this uh, with them, try to bond it. And uh, provisional treatment will be covering of exposed dentin with glass ionomer followed by uh, permanent restoration. And if fracture is close to the pulp, if it is within 0.5 millimeters of pulp, where you are able to clinically see the pinkish hue on the tooth, but there is no frank bleeding, in such cases, you will, you will provide uh, uh, my, my calcium hydroxide uh, capping, or you'll place uh, calcium hydroxide as base and cover it with uh, uh, material like glass ionomer. So if this, this fracture was a little bit more towards the pulp, it will be classified as enamel dentin pulp fracture. Here, the pulp is exposed. So again, depending on whether if it is uh, a younger patient with immature uh, uh, tooth, that is, it has open apex, you should try to preserve pulp vitality and you should do uh, either pulp capping or partial pulpotomy. And uh, you will do a follow-up in six to eight weeks. And then again, after one year, if this tooth ever turns non-vital, you will have to do endodontic therapy, depending on the stage of root completion. And uh, patients that have mature uh, apex or closed apex, in these cases, endotherapy is usually the treatment of choice. Let's look at uh, some other uh, uh, injuries with teeth. Concussion, here, this is a diagrammatic representation. I've segmented tooth number nine, and uh, here you can see tooth number nine in a sagittal section, and here, again, tooth number nine in a coronal view. The tooth appears unchanged in, a, in its position. The tooth has not been displaced. There is no vertical or any movement of this tooth. These teeth are generally tended to touch or on tapping, and our uh, teeth will not show increased mobility. And on radiographs, there will be no uh, changes, no appreciable changes. And that is true both for a periapical and a cone beam CT. So here, tooth is in, in its same socket. There is no movement or displacement. So you will not observe any changes radiographically. And these teeth usually require no management, no treatment. And uh, in these cases, you should still do follow-up and monitor pulpal uh, health. And if these teeth turn non-vital, then you will have to do endotherapy. But uh, again, you will have to do it. Let's take a look at this image. 
again, the simulated uh, drawing, it is depicting intrusive luxation. So the green outline is the tooth, green outline is the location or position of the tooth after injury. And here you can see that the tooth has been displaced inward, intrusive luxation. It has been pushed into the alveolar bone. So again, depending on whether the root is completely formed versus if it is an open apex, you need to, uh, in cases which have open apex or incomplete root formation, you need to monitor for pulp vitality. If the pulp becomes necrotic, you should consider pulp revascularization therapy or apexification. Teeth that have a completely formed root with closed apex, pulp will likely become necrotic and root canal therapy should be initiated. And uh, for endo, after cleaning and disinfection, a temporary dressing with calcium hydroxide is recommended for up to four weeks. Let's look at these images that are representing extrusive luxation. So again, green outline is the position or the location of the tooth after injury, where we can see that the tooth has been displaced outwards or towards the incisal table. The tooth should be repositioned gently by reinserting it into the socket, push it inwards into the socket. Teeth that have incomplete root formation, they should be monitored for pulp vitality. If this pulp becomes necrotic, pulp revascularization should be considered. And teeth that have complete root formation, in such cases, pulp necrosis is common. And if diagnosed, root canal treatment is indicated. These images represent lateral luxation. So again, green outline is the position of the tooth after injury. The tooth is usually displaced in buccolingual direction, like we see here in this example. These are usually associated with the fracture of facial cortical bone or the cortical plate will be interrupted, it will be fractured, it will be broken. And reposition the tooth by reorienting the tooth into the socket you could do it by digital manipulation, just with your hand if you're able to position it into its original position within the socket. Or if it is a rigid location of the tooth after injury, you might have to use the forceps to guide it back into the socket. Again, depending on whether the permanent tooth has open apex or closed apex, uh, depending on the root formation, you will monitor for pulp vitality. And again, if the tooth becomes necrotic, pulp revascularization revascul should be done for incomplete root formation. And teeth that have complete root formation, pulp necrosis is common. And again, root canal treatment is indicated for uh, such teeth. Evulsion, where a tooth is displaced out of the socket. Here, the cone beam CT image on the right here, it shows us maxillary anterior area. This is floor of nasal cavity. This is palatal cortical plate. This is part of the buccal plate that is remaining. And this is the outline of the socket of the tooth that has been lost. So again, avulsion, uh, the teeth that have been avulsed, depending on whether this permanent tooth has a closed apex or open apex, your management will differ. In addition, depending on whether the tooth has already been replanted by the patient or the parent, or whether the patient or parent has brought this tooth to you in a physiologic medium, like in saline or milk or under the tongue uh, stored with the saliva. And also the duration of the time, uh, if this tooth is stored dry and it is less than 60 minutes, the, the, manage, the immediate management of the patient will vary. And also, if this tooth has been stored dry for more than 60 minutes, prognosis varies, and your management of such a tooth will also vary. 
in all of these cases, uh, whether the tooth has been replanted by the patient or a parent, or you are uh, replanting this, this tooth back, you will provide a flexible splint for one to two weeks. In addition, if endo treatment was not initiated immediately after replantation, it should be initiated uh, seven to 10 days after replantation, but before splint removal. And in these cases, calcium hydroxide is helpful and calcium hydroxide is recommended as an intracanal medicament for up to four weeks following root canal filling. And it is followed by root canal filling. And teeth that have open apex, so again, these are permanent teeth with open apex. Again, it depends on uh, uh, whether this tooth was replanted by the patient or the parent, or if it has been brought to you in physiologic medium, and if it has been dry, it is dry for less than 60 minutes, versus if it was stored dry for more than 60 minutes. And our uh, goal for replanting or developing immature teeth that have not had complete root formation in children is to allow for revascularization of the pulp space. For very immature teeth, root canal treatment should be avoided unless uh, there is uh, non-vital pulp. And if pulp necrosis is diagnosed, pulp revascularization, like apexification, is recommended. These are the resources uh, which are very helpful. I cited these uh, during the presentation. Uh, but here again, uh, I have cited them here. This is uh, American College of Radiology's uh, Radiation Dose Assessment Introduction. And uh, this is AAE's Guidelines for Treatment of Traumatic Dental Injuries. And these are IADT's International uh, Association of Dental Traumatology's Guidelines for Evaluation and Management of Traumatic Dental Injuries. With this, thank you so much. This is my email. If you have uh, any questions or anything comes to your mind, any feedback that you have, please feel free to email me. Or if you have any interesting uh, image that you want to share, this is my email address. You can reach out to me and uh, you can email me the questions and uh, we can also take uh, questions here. All right, we are going to open up the live Q&A session now. Please enter your questions in the have a question widget on the right side of your console, and we will answer them live momentarily. So our first question is asking, is it possible to have some handout um, from tonight's webinar? So tonight's webinar, or today's webinar was recorded, and we will be emailing out the recording within the next week. So we will have that available to everyone attending. Because thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your help. And uh, thank you to Dr. Severance and the entire team at Henry Shine. You guys have been extremely helpful in uh, organizing and uh, presenting this content. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll give it just another uh, minute or two to see if some questions trickle in. Thank you to everyone for attending. All right. It looks like we have a question that came in. Why a soft splint for an avulsion versus extra coronal fixed splints? It is, it is a temporary short term, uh, about four week uh, splinting just to keep uh, the tooth stable. And that's why. And I think even Dr. Chang has a question that uh, he knows that I'm not promoting any CBCT over another, but can we let him know which system uh, were you using? So I get scans, uh, these scans that you have seen were acquired on a lot of different uh, uh, machines. And most of the times I just get the scan from the referring doctor and we don't even know which machine it was taken on. So it is an assortment. But like I said at the beginning, we are not... Uh, uh, specifically talking about any machine. If you have questions and you are considering uh, one of the CBCT machines, I'm sure the team at Henry Shine will be able to give you details on a lot of different units. But this was uh, just strictly looking at interpreting uh, trauma on various uh, CBCT machines, irrespective of the machine that the scan was taken on. Thank you, doctor. We okay. have quite a few um, questions coming in here. Yes. Um, let's see. 
I have not okay. heard of, oh, do you have one that you want to start off with? Uh, sure. Yeah, you're right. There are a lot of questions that are coming up and I'm <laughs> going from bottom to top. Uh, okay. So there is a question, is CBCT standard of care for implants? I think I will have to talk to Dr. Severance and uh, do another webinar just on that topic. But as you guys know, standard of care is, uh, is what another prudent dentist would do in your situation. And it, it varies and depends on the specific clinical situation that you were working on. Um, then we have uh, Dr. Walker. How can we send a scan for analysis to Dr. Parisher? Uh, there are a lot of different uh, CBCT interpretation companies uh, that are available that you can find just with a Google search. Uh, okay, then we have a few more. Uh, can I explain different views again of CBCT? Sure. Uh, so I think, again, once you get the recorded uh, presentation, you, you can go through it. And uh, But if you still have any specific uh, questions, if Corinne could show my uh, email one more time, please feel free to email me and I will be able to send you resources or in answer any specific questions that you might have. Okay. Uh, will proof of CE be emailed? I'm sure they will send you uh, that information. Yes, okay. if you complete the survey, um, there will be um, that confirmation for sure. What's the best way to learn about CBCT? If you don't have CBCT at your office, uh, do something like you're doing today. Uh, attend courses uh, and uh, start playing with the scans. Even if you don't have a machine in your practice, I think it is still prudent and important to learn about cone beam because a patient might walk into your office with a disc in their hand and uh, we will have to review it. What's your opinion on using CBCT to diagnose confirmed vertical root fracture? CBCT is a great diagnostic aid if you are in doubt. Uh, another resource there would be there are uh, guideline paper from American Academy of Endodontics and American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology. Uh, you could refer to that but you will, you will use your cone beam in addition to the clinical presentation, now the way the patient is presenting. If you have vertical bone loss, if you have uh, symptoms that make you think of a vertical crack, along with the cone beam, you will be able to make your diagnosis. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Croston has a good question. How likely is it that a hospital ER will have access to a good CBCT machine in case of an oral traumatic injury. Uh, again, this is this is relatively new. Most hospital ERs do not have a CBCT machine, but if it is if it is a hospital setting which has a strong dental program, they might have access to a CBCT, and it will be helpful to look at the teeth. I think these are good questions, but if you have if you have more questions please feel free to uh, email me. So this is this is my email. If you have any more questions, anything else that comes up, please feel free to email me and I will, I will respond there. Thank you, doctor. Definitely appreciate Perfect. that. There. Well, thank you, doctor, for your time you. and expertise on this topic. And thank you to everyone for attending and for the questions. Um, we did record tonight today's webinar, so we will email the recording out sometime in the next week. If you are interested in attending future webinars, you can visit www.henryshinedental.com slash webinars. And lastly, we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you so much.